as we know and experience it will change radically by the year 2012. History as we know it will cease to exist and the lives we have been living will be over once and for all. The approaching revelations concerning our origins, history, and destiny, together with the exposure of the roguery of clerical, academic, and political demagogues, will occur because of changes occurring within the psyche of human beings, which it's in itself is mapped in the stars. Michael Tessarian, born in Ireland and an expert on the occult histories of Ireland and America, has made the deepest researchers into the comparative mythologies of the world into his own country's ancient and mysterious Celtic traditions. He has sought to bring about <coughs> the understanding of the orchestrated chaos of modern times and reveal how the political and military mechanizations of the present have their roots in the ancient past. As well as stating the problems, Michael also furnishes us with the solutions to the moral and social predicaments that have beset humankind for millennia. I have the great pleasure of welcoming Michael Tessarian to our show. How are you, Michael? Hi, uh, Freeman, fine, thank you. Lovely to be back on your wonderful, wonderful show. Appreciate you having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, 2012. I mean, it's getting closer and closer. We're past that date of uh, halfway mark in the 13-year yeah. cycle. Yeah, um, the cycle itself, basically, the countdown started in 1999, and that means that November 8th, I believe, uh, 2003, was the exact halfway point. And it's good to track these kinds of things. Uh, maybe your audience can think back in their own lives what was happening within 30 days on either side of that period. Uh, it was a very interesting time for me. I was watching very closely things that would happen, but if people cast their mind back just to the November 8th period, 2003, and try to check into what was happening at that time. And I know some of your audience keep very deep, you know, good details in their journals about certain uh, things that happened to them. So just check back, and you'll see that there was something important happening around that time, either socially in your own life or, you know, within your own being. But yes, as you say, we're actually considerably, you know, further on than that, and that's why my work then now becomes even more important, because stating a bunch of interesting mythological and historical anecdotes to people who are not in the know and who think you're you know crazy uh, or think that you're some sort of prophet mad prophet you know that's that's obviously very difficult but as we move closer and closer to these junction points and as we pass these uh, meridians these these aspects even the ordinary citizen starts to get clued in that something is very very wrong i mean you know we would hope that they'd know by now but as you can obviously see, a lot of people in the world do not know that they're being shot at right now. They do not know that there is a war of Armageddon happening. And they do not know that there's a major, you know, karmic changes going on in the world. But we, we don't really have to do a lot of pushing. I've been saying this for many years now on talks and radio stations when people get very pessimistic and keep saying, oh, what are we going to do? And it's so difficult to wake up people. And I've said, well, why are you pushing so hard? Don't you, don't you understand that nature has its own wonderful and brilliant way of waking the hell up? Of people, you don't. You, nobody's asking you to run around with a placard. Middle America, middle, the most, the most, the dumb darn, you know, people are going to be coming to you, telling you something's happening as time goes by. So there is no need to blow any trumpets because nature has its own miraculous way of bringing the truth that something is changing in the world order and the world status. To even the most, you know, closed-minded person is going to be just uh, aware. Now, what my work is to show is when that awareness starts to come, it's not entirely pleasant for people. And a lot of people have knee-jerk reactions, and a lot of people get into fear. And so I keep you know, meeting and hearing from people that are in that syndrome. They've listened to people like us. They understand that something big is coming. But then the ego, which, of course, doesn't like change, and gets very afraid of that, starts to then get into all sorts of other paranoia and, and fear. And, of course, that's when Big Brother, the, the, the evil arcs, move in even more because that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for you to re you react in confusion. So what's happening, I, as you read in the article, as we talked about the article um, on the website, I believe the changes are very positive. And you've read that. Yes. But yes. even though the changes may be positive, that's one thing. But then people's reaction when they hear about change, just the very fact that change is coming, 
often get into fear, and that's immediately what the parasite, you see, that is around us, this adversarial energy, starts to feed off. So what I need to always make sure that is clear to people is that, look, note, note that fear reaction in yourself, but don't worry. The ultimate end is good. We are freeing ourselves from this draconian New World Order situation. It's a sort of a nature's assistance. But in order to do that, it's the same premise as any doctor has to do. It's the sharp shriek system to bring the patient to wellness. There'll be an uncomfortable period first. And this is what needs to be understood, that the overall uh, healing of the, of the world is taking place. And the healing of the psyche is what's going on. But there's a toxic release first. Now, this should be absolutely one-on-one for a lot of people. Right. But unfortunately, it's not. And people are running around with head, like headless chickens and fear and panic and paranoia. And this is, of course, what the other side is hoping for, yes. that you will react in that way and get all fearful and lose your center so that they can take over and go, but we'll give you the structure. Yeah, we absolutely. will insert ourselves and give you this needed uh, structure. All you need to do is conform. We know you're in fear. We know you're in panic. We know that you can't organize your own life. But George Bush will do it for you. Oh, yeah. Big brother who's really, by the way, Big Daddy, if you want to get into the Freudian psychology of it, we know it politically as Big Brother. But Big Brother is nothing more than a well-known psychological concept of psychologists known as Big Daddy, the father image. Please help me. I've got no structure inside. So can you please give me structure, Mr. State, Mr. New World Order? And now you're coming along. We said on the last program that we were on with you, Freeman, the, the the system, the establishment, does not have power over us. We give it our power. Right. It, it, nobody's coming in and asking you for your power. We're giving it away. Okay. America is giving it away collectively. Yes. But they're hoping that with all of this foment and with all of this war and all of this, you know, agro and all of this uh, economic uh, harassment, you see, uh, they're pulling the chains from the Federal Reserve. They can, like a yo-yo, take the economy any way they want. But they know that they need to do this and they need to do that and they need to fill the news with horrors and you see all of these other things. And slowly even the most uh, centered person starts to lose it. That's precisely what they want. That's precisely what they want. They either want you walking in the dark so you don't see your horizon to which you're going, or alternatively, they want you to be hyper-focused on the mountain peak so you're not in touch with the journey as you're going. Right. Both are lethal. Both are, both are problematic. So now everybody's got their you know, focus now on tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? Oh, my goodness, where's the mountain peak? Hope I don't lose sight of it. We can't afford to lose sight of the landmark. And the beautiful journey of your life is what you're missing. You're not smelling the roses anymore. You see, and the, these are the two strategies by which they get individuals to lose the sanity, step by step by step. And this is going to be continuing even more on a social level, uh, as we can see. But that doesn't mean that the individual needs to go along in the same way, to struggle so hard that they get trapped in, even more in their own web. We're here to announce to the fact that as long as you're in your center, as long as you're in the uh, place where you need to be, as Joseph Campbell said, as, as you're touching your bliss, you're at the center point, then you have nothing whatsoever to fear from any external changes, no matter what they be. And this goes the same for Belfast, Northern Ireland, and the chaos that you know, I saw there. It goes for the same in South Africa. It goes it, in any chaotic situation. It is the person who is in their center who is completely sure of their inner strength and their spiritual guidance hasn't got a thing in the world to worry about because that your guide will be there to assist you. But if you close the door on that guide, then you have everything to fear and you'll be left to the wolves. I find this to be absolutely true. Yeah, right. it's a spiritual message, but it's not becoming one that is going to be most appropriate even to the average rank-and-file person who has never opened themselves to these facts. But, right. you know, again, there's nothing really to worry about. You know, uh, talking about 2012, one of the, the most prominent writers... On that is a guy called Carlos Barrios. I've been following his work, and I want to read a small quote from him because it actually highlights the difference between my work and a lot of these other guys. He says in a very short quote, he says, According to Mr. Barrios, this is a crucially important moment for humanity and for the earth. Each person is important. If you have incarnated in this era, you have spiritual work to do balancing the planet. Now, that sounds lovely, and that sounds very flowery, and that sounds uh, excellent, so let's charge her at the door and uh, quickly you know, work on how to balance the planet. But Michael Tassarian goes, excuse me, stop. Stop before you charge right there. What in the hell can you do to balance the planet when you yourself are not in balance? Exactly. So can we please come in and close the door and ask this question again? So what we have here is a bunch of pseudo-shamanism pseudo of people who really do not have the true answer, who know that there's a problem, and then give you all of this ludicrous, uh, you know, stuff to try, and then we burn off our energies and then find out, oh my goodness, 10 years later this didn't work. 
right. because these individuals have not thought it out properly. I'm sorry, you can't balance the planet if you yourself are not in balance internally. But does this man then go on, and like so many others, and I'm not just pointing him out to be rude, I'm just saying I'm, I'm pretty much sick of this stuff for myself, that's why I'm being so loud about it right now. Okay. The thing is, you see, they don't have the actual <laughs> solutions. So, of course, all this activity is going to amount to nothing. We have to be in balance ourselves. You can't be infirm inside yourself and then go around, you see, and, and, and fix everybody else. It's just not possible. Is this something that you're hoping your online mystery school will help to achieve? My work is, yeah. My work is dedicated to that uh, purest level, that Gnostic shamanism, which is inside Christianity, which is inside Judaism. It's nothing new. We don't have to reinvent any wheels here. There's no New Age prophet going to tell you how to do it. It's all there. It's, it's within our official religions, and it's within the Gnostic kernel. But what I'm against, my, my main job is not to show people so much what to do, it's to show them what not to do. I am not so good, uh, I'm not in the league of the people who invent new systems. I'm only in the league of the people who destroy the old systems, yes. the old corrupt systems. My job is to come and tell you not to rearrange furniture on the Titanic. You're right. I'm going to tap you on the shoulder and go, can you just like not bother? Yes. Because this thing is going to hit the iceberg no matter what, so you rearranging all the furniture ain't going to matter one bit. That's more my job. Now, of course, I get a lot of dirty looks. Oh, yeah. Get out of the way. You know, we're rearranging furniture on the Titanic. Who the hell are you to tell us not to do this? Go and, you know, do something else. So that's fine. That's no problem. But my point is this old world system, as Plato, as Vico, as Nietzsche, as Tennyson understood, is coming to its end. All things in life go in circles, in spheres, in, in cycles. Absolutely. Same thing is the seasons of the psyche. And right now, the human psyche is very, very toxic. So it has to go through a natural spring cleaning cycle. 2012 in the Mayan calendar, in short, in brief, just represents a sort of a marker point to the era in which nature goes through the spin-dry cycle. I refer to it, you know, in the uh, online, uh, I have a free talk online, people can go and check it out on the web stream, The Origins of Evil. In that talk on The Origins of Evil, I talk about it like the roach cleaner is coming. Nature knows very well how to clean itself. It does it every year. I don't know if people have noticed there is a, such a thing as the seasonal cycle, you know, every single year. Right now we're in it, right, the winter cycle. Right. So don't you think that that happens also further up the fractal, further up the uh, Fibonacci series? You're damn right it does. Nature knows how to clean itself when it gets too toxic, when it's, uh, when it's veins, it's arteries, what we call the dodecahedron, the earth grid. When that thing is backing up like a sewer system, right, which it is now, right. and unfortunately the, we, the human beings feel it, but the animals and the plants feel it sooner. Right. So when you're hearing about these beached whales, Mm -hmm. and beached porpoises all the way from Canada to uh, Thursday Island in Australia, all over the world. If you, if you go online and read the various newspapers from all around the world, you'll find numer innumerable accounts of these freak behaviors in, in birds and animals. And then they say, uh, you know, there's various reasons for this. One of the biggest reasons is that the earth grid itself, of which the animals are there to help clean that grid, has been so made so toxic by people and by the world leaders that unfortunately it's now backing up, just like a sewer system in your house will back up. Now that is going to infect everyone, and the animals feel it first, and then they go insane, and then they, their habit patterns, you know, their habitat is ruined. But if it's backing up far enough, it is going to start coming through the human field as well, which it already is. Yeah. And that will help uh, to make people more psychotic, as they're already becoming. That will also create uh, fear and anger and the need to uh, project that anger onto other people, which is what is happening now in the war because war is one of the age-old ways of expatiating this kind of backup in the system, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, you say that the shit is not yours, it's somebody else, so they you go to war and all the rest of it. We have to understand what the meta theme is when we're looking at all of these things. The news and the newspapers are not going to come and tell us these metaphysical principles, you see, behind all of this. We've got to spend our own time and work this out. And what it has to do is, is the deep connections between the psyche and the physical world. And my work on the website, in the, I've got a new article, people should go on the website, to read the free web stream will explain this in greater detail than we can do here but there are deep symbiotic connections between your psyche the inner mind and physical nature like uh, Carl Jung said that which you do not make conscious in yourself will appear outside of you as fate then you'll think it's happening outside of you when in fact you're actually calling it into being inside yourself I've been trying very hard to focus on the positive recently but we okay. are destroying people's worlds, as you put it, you know, with deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And they're not quite ready for that. And like you say, the ego screams out at this, you know, oh, no, I had all these plans. I had all these things that I was yeah. supposed to do. And they think that, you know, that'll be eliminated. 
And, you know, the truth is that, you know, your, your true soul purpose will be opened up and, and allowed to, to show itself. Well, see, this is the thing. The, we, the people who react against this, where this is nonsense to them, are the people who are caught in the, in the realm of doing. We're taught from when we're born to be doers, not beers. We also think that by losing the mystery of how to be, that we can be expert at doing. Uh, you think that in 2,000 years, or at least since the Industrial Revolution, people would have got their minds around that that's not working. But again, you know, the world just chugs along. We've had the finest filmmakers, we've had the finest musicians try to explain this to us. There's a new movie out now called One, which I recommend that people go and see, you know, that talk about this, that if you lose the secret of being, then how can you be an expert at doing? But see then, if, if you tell somebody, leave, leave your doing down for a moment and just be, you know, it, it, it's very difficult for people to do that. Very difficult. Yes. And like Jordan Maxwell has said many times, if you come and wake somebody up by putting a big light in their face, you're going to get either two reactions. One, they're going to roll over and go back to sleep, or they're going to strike out at the person holding that light. So the first reaction when light comes in your way is a negative one. Right. You either try to escape it and avoid it, or you try to lash out at the person holding it. But you see, don't let that concern you. The deconstructive act as you read in the article, is actually the modus operandi, or it is the, it is the means that the Holy Spirit uses. I try to explain this in the article by using you know, mythological motifs. But basically, the fact of the matter is that that which all religion, and believe me, Christianity is not the only religion to talk about the Holy Spirit. Hinduism has had it as well. The, uh, the Mexican uh, Aztecs and Maya have very much their Holy Spirit. Uh, the uh, Native American Indians of North America talk about the the great winged one, you see, mm -hmm. the overarching great spirit. So in the article, I talk about the fact that this act of deconstruction, when you're doing it in your own life, is absolutely akin to what the Holy Spirit is. There are connect there's a direct linguistic and filiogenetic, uh, excuse me, uh, etymological connection between the concept of deconstructing, that means er you know, undoing and, and erasing, and getting rid of the dirt and the toxicity, that is very much the action of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit operates in that way. It doesn't build new things or get more or add more or want more or have more. It says what you've got goes through a cycle where it's no longer needed. You know, flowers in your house will die. Dust will gather on your table even if you do nothing. Fruit rots. Cars gather rust. Right? There's a natural action in the universe of deconstruction. Instead of hating that and trying to build plastic walls to keep it out, Get in touch with the beauty in it. Get in touch with the beauty of that deconstructiveness and bring it into your lives. It's very liberating. what America needs to learn because America has been completely anabolic. Even in its spiritual quest, it's always been about getting, getting, getting and having more and building up and owning and possessing, you see? Yes. But there's another side that is also about letting go and deconstructing. And it's very, very simple. The, the solutions that we talk about are very simple. Right. They're absolutely natural to you. It's just that you've been trained to only do one thing. And that, that type of acquisitive nature is not st strangling you. It's now literally um, choking you to death. So you need to undo and let go. And it's a deconstructive act. It might be difficult in the, in the beginning, but as you learn the, the ropes, it becomes very, very refreshing. Yes. It's exactly the same thing as if you've got a, a room in your house that you want to you know, use, but it's filled and filled with junk and boxes. Well, there's two ways to go uh, about you know, bringing that room to perfection. You can stand at the window and scream for the wind to come in, which is what most people are really doing right now. Or you can roll up your sleeves and move the boxes out. <laughs> then the wind is automatically there. The fresh air is automatically there without you having to scream for it to come in through the window. That's right. We've been, just taught, we've been taught in, in nature, we've been taught in our schools, excuse me, to do the, the, you know, the first, to do the former. And we're, we're obviously, it's imbecilic to do that, yet that's what we're doing. It's the same thing with the garden. If you buy a beautiful house but it has a pretty uh, raggedy, weedy garden out the back, you can stand in that garden and you can scream till your lungs cave in for the birds and the bees to come into your garden, right? You can do that if you want. You'll just be comic relief to everybody watching. <laughs> yeah. Or you can get down on your knees and you can start to prune and you can start to pull out the weeds. When you do that, automatically, the birds and the bees and everything else start to come to make their home in your garden. You didn't have to exert any effort to do that. Nature immediately reciprocates your action. Well, it's exactly the same thing with the garden of the psyche. Right. Every single thing in our life is cleaned. We sweep the driveway, we wash our cars, we clean our bodies, we make our beds. We would not consider eating off the same dirty plates twice in a day without cleaning them first. Well, then, uh, excuse me, what's so different, different then with the emotions? What's so different with the psyche? How come we've neglected the cleaning of the psyche 
for so many millennia? How come we've murdered and strangled every shaman, every druid, every true teacher of wisdom that knew how to do that? You see, our villages, we used to have such people who used to take care of that. Right. They're all dead. So what do you think is going to happen when you kill all the true doctors of the soul, all of these hygienists that we need? Well, you're going to have what you see now when you walk out into the street. A bunch of crazy, lunatic, passive-aggressive, completely dysfunctional individuals and running that, amok without a faintest idea in the wide world what's going on around them and, and completely, you know, in a state of terrible, terrible malady inside. Right. There's nothing wrong with it. That's just the consequence that you have when you have gone down the wrong road. And then we've had all these new age characters insert themselves in between us. Go, but I've got the answer. Follow me. Yeah. And now 30 years have gone by and the world is even worse than it was before because a lot of these people, excuse me, were charlatans. Our time is short, so that's why I'm being very Irish about this. I wish I could be more polite, but as a matter of fact, I can't be anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. We've had a lot of total charlatans pretending to be shamans and pretending to have our answers, but they themselves are some of the most toxic people in the world. Right. They're into healing others because they're the ones that need the healing. But that's fine. They've had their day. We, you know, we've passed on. We're in a new millennium now. We can say thank you very much. Don't need you. I'm going to look into my own answers. Yes. I'm going to realize that I am my own teacher. I am my own priest. I'm priestess. Uh, I'm going to, you know, hang around with other people like me, and I'm going to, you know, realize that I've got my own answers. That's what my mystery school in particular is about. That's what my entire message is about. Fantastic. That became crystal clear to me when I started reading Deepak Chopra. Same thing, and yeah. And he, you know, I saw that my body knew exactly what it needed to eat and didn't want to eat. That's and right. And see how, how successful his systems have been because of that? All right. Very simple. It's right there. It's within all of us, right? It is. And you see, what we have to understand also is that when this particular toxic energy backs up and makes a lot of people, you know, ill or depressed or uh, stuck, yes, we, we have to realize that there's nothing wrong with those people. They are reacting to a negative situation. Their depression, their psychosis, their um, countercultural delinquency, like we're seeing in the children, is a perfect reaction to a toxic situation. There's no point pointing a finger at them and going, you're, you're crazy, you're a freak, you can't, you're not adjusted, you can't work in the system, you, you're no use to the status quo. The man who studied psych, uh, schizophrenics more than any other human being on earth was the late uh, uh, psychologist from Scotland, R.D. Lang. And R.D. Lang turned all of psych psychoanalysis and psychiatry upside down by saying that there's nothing insane about psychotics. There's not, schizophrenics are in complete control. And they completely misunderstood what he was saying. Right. His main point, or his famous quotation, was that insanity is a perfectly normal reaction to an unhealthy situation or circumstance. The ego, needing to have balance in all things, just chooses a very unlikely balance. Right. But the psychosis, or what we would call this, uh, the schizophrenic patterns, is a person trying to ward off the sickness without really knowing what to do. Right. So it goes through these bizarre behavioral patterns, you see, trying in some desperate way to find a winning point in a no-win situation that the world has handed to it. So what we have to realize is that we have, in our, in our, in our world, when we see the delinquency and we see, we see all the psychosis and the paranoia, this is the human race, or the individual trying desperately to find that oasis. Now, of course, there's a better way to find, but even, even what we would call negative patterns in people and in society is actually a desperate, desperate, desperate way to alleviate the tension from this backed-up toxicity. We have not been taught about this. We've not been taught about how to heal all of this. So, of course, then it just continually keeps pouring into our house, so to speak, and then we're trying to find the one corner, you see, which is just a little bit less dirty, a little bit less filthy, a little bit less stinky. Well, that's a natural reaction. I can understand why people would do that. But the thing is that you are then becoming, what, what you're becoming is the squatter in your own home. You're becoming the prisoner in your own palace. Right. Better to roll up the sleeves and start cleaning out the mess. America has still not got that answer yet. Or at least it's trying to clean it up, but in a very, very dysfunctional way. By murdering and killing and blaming everybody else and losing its sovereignty. Which is exactly, as I talk about in the Origins of Evil, Webstream, this is exactly what the great enemies of America wanted for us. They have set this situation up so that America would lose its sovereignty and its economy and would be available to be controlled and to be raped. They understand our reactions. And I really believe that they're trying to devastate the planet to such a point to where we have no choice but to turn to these seeming uh, saviors. Yes, that's yeah. what they put themselves up as, you see. When they know that you're deeply insecure inside, and that you're operating from a very low level of rationality and intelligence. When they know that your utter, utter environment seems very uh, chaotic to you and that you have no control, 
then we psychologically look to those who appear to be in control. Actually, they don't have any control either, but they, they appear to do. It's just a big game, a big act. So big we buy bag. the ticket and say, sure, I'll watch George Bush go through his motions. I'll watch Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Thatcher, any mass murdering psych tyrant, you see, who's even sicker than all of us. But remember, as I'm saying, and please excuse all this psychological jargon, I just don't know any other way to explain what I'm talking about to people. But the fact of the matter is that we create these demagogues. And I'm not saying anything that other philosophers have not said. We give rise to these big beings who know exactly how to do what we're doing, how, how to do what they're doing. Right. Uh, and it's, 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 it's like somebody said, Vernon Howard, one of your great um, philosophers of this country, he said, healing fails to occur because it is much easier to harm another than heal oneself. And yeah. that couldn't, you couldn't put it in any better than that. <laughs> that, that fits the bill. I, I constantly reread the Celestine prophecies just as uh, keep a, a positive aspect going on and keep those uh, ideas going of, of synchronicity. And I find that, you know, just reading it helps me and all of a sudden my whole world turns around uh, just by changing my brain pattern on the whole situation. Yes, you take responsibility. Create new chi in your life. Chi is a, a you know, Japanese or Chinese word for uh, energy. Ki is the Japanese, prana is what the Indians called it. Um, Fohat is what the ancient uh, Chinese called it. We call it energy, flow, libido. Do something in your life, you see, to constantly keep the energy flowing. If you're into sports, then do that. But do it with a consciousness. Do it, don't just do it idly like it's just recreation. Do it because you're keeping your body energy flowing. Have, you know, fountains in your home, water flowing. Have chimes, have fish in, a, in, in, a, in an aquarium. You see, play music good music, any kind of music, read excellent books, watch good shows on TV, anything to keep the flow of chi going where your mind, is, the wheels are constantly moving because it's like they're trying to hypnotize you to go to sleep. And we have to say, yeah, but you're not going to put me to sleep. Right. And they go, but we are certainly going to put you to sleep so that you'll be under our spell. You go, try it, buddy. <laughs> I ain't going to fall under your spell. I know how to keep myself awake. That's exactly what America, the, the people of light, need to do. And you do that physically by even keeping the chi. Study it. Study feng shui. Study geomancy. Study what the Indians call vastu. And bring it into your life so that you're constantly flushing the, the negative energy out so that you are clean. If anybody watches the uh, movie that came out a few years back, Nostradamus, there's a brilliant scene in the early part of that movie where the whole town is running around with a plague, right? It's an incredible scene where you just see all this chaos. And there's Nostradamus standing at a well, strips all his clothes off, you know, washes himself down, He's the doctor going around treating a lot of these people, but there's a beautiful scene where this man is just still. He's in the middle, cleaning himself ri ritualistically, and everybody else is just running around in panic. Well, use that image. That's you. Make, make yourself that Nostradamus, the person who knows how to clean their own self, you see, so you don't care what kind of toxicity is running amok in the streets around you or in the world around you or even in other people around you that you happen to be emotionally connected to. Be very cautious about how people try to dump their filth and their toxicity and their energy onto you. That's part of this growth. That's part of this uh, learning of the Holy Spirit. This is what you've equated to the arrival of the energy of Pluto? Yeah, Pluto and Uranus. A lot of people who keep on talking about the age of Aquarius uh, seem to actually not know too much about real astrology or, or let's say stellar astrology. The age of Aquarius is not some new age uh, phenomenon. This is a very serious thing to do with astrological and astronomic alignments. But as I talk about in my work, Anything that happens externally in the stars is already happening inside. The, the heavens is only a map of psychic changes that are going on inside. Um, when you say Pluto or Uranus, you see, or uh, Aquarius, these are just outward names for inner things. It's like a magnet moving under the table. You know, you can put a magnet under something and you can, and you can move a metal object yeah. on the surface of the table. And people go, my goodness, how are you, how are you moving that? Because they think it's actually the pen or the needle moving, but underneath is the magnet. Right. Our magnet is this human psyche. The stars are just the needle on the table moving. Now, most astrologers have got it all back to front. They think that those stars are actually affecting consciousness. I don't know how they ever got into thinking this, that the rocks in space uh, floating up there have some effect on consciousness, but that's, you know, it's just another thing in the world, another uh, lunacy that's happening. The real fact of the matter is that we are internally going through lots of psychic changes. These are mapped in the outer heavens. And good astrologers know what I'm talking about. Now, the coming of Pluto is very much akin to the concept that we know as the Holy Spirit. It's, it's difficult to explain in a short time what that is, but if people go online and read my article, they'll have it clearly explained. In the Hindu trinity, 
They have the, Hind the Christian Trinity actually comes from the Hindu Trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. All right? Brahma, uh, uh, when uh, reversed, is Abraham, you see? Mm -hmm. um, Ishwara is Sarah. There's, there's all the uh, Judaic patterns come out of the, the Brahman tradition of India, the ancient, ancient traditions of India. And in the Trimurti, which is the Trinity of the Indians, they have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And in the Western system, we have God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that simply means that Shiva... In the, in the Hindu trinity, who was the father of humanity, represents the Holy Spirit in the Hindu trinity. And it's, oh, they're also very aligned to the Christ force, because the Christ was always talking about the Holy Spirit and aligning himself with that. So the Christ, the Holy Spirit, these are very interlinked concepts. Right. In astrology, or excuse me, in religion, and especially in Christian religion, and even in, in Druidic, Celtic folklore, the Holy Spirit was always symbolized by the dove. And we still have that concept in uh, Christianity today. Yes. But astrologically, the dove relates to the star sign of, Plu of Scorpio and to the planet Pluto. Because the indication was that it is the Scorpionic energy that represents the deconstructive Shiva action that comes in to clean house. All right. Now this, is a, this is also once was a Christian notion, except that they've sweetened the Trinity so much that they've basically given us only an extremely vague understanding of what the third part of the, of the Trinity represents. Oh, it's, it's okay for you to think of it as some holy ghost, quote-unquote, right. which <laughs> doesn't mean anything at all. Right. I don't know where that came from. Or you can think of it as some vague, you know, uh, disembodied spirit protector, blah, blah, blah. Or uh, originally people would go, no, I think in early Christianity it used to be feminine. They, they had it with a Sophia, but we're not even right. really sure what that means. So as long as it's very vague, then Chris, that's okay for Christians. But no Christian is meant to ask, hang on a minute, I've checked back on the mythologies of the world. We all have this. In early Christianity, they definitely spoke of it as the dove and as this uh, very, very physical thing that related to the part of the self that must always be in, a, in alignment with the truth, which is why it says in the Holy Bible, every sin will be forgiven to you except the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because that's which yourself. I would think that that would be so serious that most people would want to know what on earth is that. Right. You know, but again... We have to be brief, but if people go online and read the article there, all of this will be explained. Now, it's very important for the future because what's happening in 2007, so meaning at the end of this year, by the way, uh, almost around where we are now, Freeman, uh -huh. next year, that means from November into December of next year, I mean of this year, 2006, right. Pluto as a planet will be crossing galactic center, crossing the meridian. Galactic center is the most important location in the heavens. It's the center of the Milky Way. It's where all the psychic uh, energy of the creation is coming. The ancients refer to it as the black sun. Sagittarius, anybody who happens to be a star sign Sagittarius. The archer of Sagittarius was made into an archer because his bow, his arrow, was meant to be pointing towards this galactic center. That's just an astrological anecdote. Because the center of our galaxy is in Sagittarius. It's called the Black Sun or Galactic Center or Galactic Meridian or whatever you want to call it. Right. And, and in the end of next year, Pluto, one of the most important planets of deconstruction and, uh, and ending and, and uh, getting rid of toxicity, is going to be like a, like a lens in front of a camera or like a lens in front of a white light. Because that's all the planets are. They're just filters. That planet energy is going to be crossing Galactic Center very slowly, and it will last for most of 2007. And most astrologers are not even on to this yet. I, I've heard barely any mention of this. And yet this is going to be of such incredible importance because as soon as that happens, even in the month previous to that, from about October, November of this year, we are going to experience a very considerable change. Individuals might feel it on the inner level. Some people might feel it first coming from the inner level. But I assume that most of the world will start noticing it in political and social happenings. It could be the rise of more disease and more toxicity. It certainly will be the rise of more fear reaction. You know, and of course, the, the governments and the state may also utilize this to have people panic even more. So there's a lot of interesting things that people need to know about, about this coming alignment. So 2012 is important, yes. But the three, four, five years leading up to it are, all, are, are just as important because they set the stage for what is coming. Right. So we are just on the beginning of now something very important. That is why right now, in 2005, 2006, people can still say, what are you talking about? This is meaningless. I don't want to listen to any of this. Believe me, Freeman, see, after 2007, we're not going to be hearing that anymore. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Right. I mean, we are moving into a place where 
they may not be able to say it right, but believe me, there's nobody going to be in any doubt about it that the world system, economically, politically, psychologically, militaristically, has once and for all completely changed. What? They, that is going to be something that's going to happen. So we are in the preparation stage now for that. I've, I've noticed that, um, you know, all, all of the symbolism and whatnot goes back to the sun. And, and what we're looking at now here, especially in Texas, it's been 12 degrees above normal every day. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this uh, solar cycle 23 that's been three times what any of the scientists predicted might have to do with our rotating to face this uh, black sun? Yep, all of it has. Because remember, even though I said Pluto crosses it in 2007, don't forget all the other minor planets have already crossed it or cross it every year. I think Mercury just crossed it at 2000. Don't quote me on that one, but I know that Mercury passes it, Venus. You see, all the smaller planets that are faster moving and their influence is not as strong, or at least the influence is more social, they also go through these aspects and these conjunctions, and some of them also cross in front of these meridians. Uh, just to make the point about 2012, yes. why it is so important, is because yes. the sun itself, on the winter solstice of 2012, that's December 22, 2012, the sun will align with galactic center when it rises on that, mor on that day. So that's why that particular day was so important to the Maya. And my forthcoming DVD that should be out in a month uh, called 2012, Where History Ends, I go into that in detail and show that. I also go into a lot of these other things. But in the meantime, if people want to get on my website and look at the, the uh, Origins of Evil talk, towards the end of that, I talk about what we're talking now, about the meaning of Pluto, and I go into greater detail about what that will mean. But you're absolutely right. The sun itself will rise back of galactic center, astrologically speaking, on December 22, 2012. So... These, this was of so much importance to the ancient Maya that they understood that it represents a uh, watershed. It will not be that the earth will be destroyed or that the, or life itself finishes. No, no, that's, that's not going to happen. But what will happen is that the way of life that we have been living, which is already redundant and passing away. I mean, I've already seen the signs of that back, you know, in 1986 and, and so on. And Barbara Han Cloud talks about it in 1986 and 1990. She mentioned as a huge ch transformation. You see, the dates are really kind of not that important. Right. It's more about what is actually the phase shift that is taking place. Even scientists now are picking up, as you've just been, trying, uh, just been saying, there's uh, changes in the Hartman waves. There's changes in the um, Schumann wave frequency. Right. There's been noted changes in the ultraviolet light. Uh, New Age people tend to think that there's going to be changes in the actual human DNA that may or may not be true. Um, but, all, yeah, all sorts of changes are going to be taking place. My particular concern is the changes psychologically within the psyche. Right. Because I believe that the psyche rules all the rest of the changes, including the external changes. I mean, doctors mostly know that your psyche, I mean, it's taken them hundreds of years to begrudgingly accept this, but they do now have to admit that the brain and the mind and your thinking patterns affect your body. Well, right. why stop there? Wilhelm Reich was ahead of us all. He said, wait a minute, it not only affects your body, but the world in which you live is affected by your own mental thought patterns. So this is what my concern is more, is the psychological changes, because I know that once those are taken care of, all the other things, you know, fix themselves. Right. That would explain, you know, the massive amount of effort to affect our psyches and not yes. really worry about the third dimension. They're, they're busy right. with our brains. And that is what I think has separated my particular work in the alternative history field or the conspiracy field from a lot of other individuals. It's very important to notice all of these external changes. Fantastic. That's been done. It's wonderful. I'm glad that it's happened. But without that knowing the common denominator, without always bringing it back to the psyche of man, there's a big missing link. And that's why I think that uh, there's a, been a, a sort of a um, missing link there that needs to be brought back to say, okay, but you see, the more and more you point out all these horrors, as well-meaning as you are, the mm -hmm. more that you write about these assassinations and these killings and these murders and this plot and this, this uh, particular uh, uh, device of the Illuminati and what have you, what, what, what tends to happen naturally, without anybody wanting it to happen, is that there's a displacement of power from the self. There's people who start to feel, oh my goodness, this Leviathan is so big, I'm just crushed underneath it. Right. And it happens automatically. And we're very much in that phase now. In the talks and conferences I go to and the emails I get, I'm very much seeing that fear, paranoia, reaction. And I know that it plays right into the hands of this uh, archetype, this big brother, big daddy archetype. So to countermand that, the people in the research community need to start factoring in again the human psyche and empowering people that way, and if they're able to. And if they're not, then they step aside and let the people who are able to do their work, because it's very, very important. Yes. 
Every time I go on the road, I take somebody with me that's never been, and I take them all around this country and show them all how the cycles work and how synchronicity works and how we are actually free within ourselves and don't need you know, the ministers or authorities. Right. Uh, In the beginning, you need them like anybody needs a teacher for steadying action. Right. But you don't see a, a guy who rides a 750 Kawasaki uh, you know, wor working with the stabilizers that a child has on his bike. Right. I mean, there's a time to take off the blinking stabilizers. And America, the time has come. World, the time has come. Let's take off the stabilizers. Let's give the pink slip to all these big, nobody, these big people who think they have all our answers because they haven't got any answers. You are the only one who has your answers. Let's get into a community of souls. That's why I do so much work, uh, Freeman, with the Druidic Celtic tradition uh -huh. because the concept there was a round table right. You know where everybody meets, the meeting of all minds, the meeting of all intelligences, pro and con, pro and negative, so that we hear the whole of it and stop reacting emotionally to somebody who's got a different opinion than us. And we understand that it's a community of all. So there's a tremendous div divisiveness and division in our world that has been perpetrated on us on purpose. There's individuals who have a policy to keep the divide and rule thing going. But just a few minutes ago, you mentioned Deepak Chopra, and it reminded me, so I've been doing a search for this incredible quote that he has that underlines what we've been talking about. May I read it? Yeah, absolutely. It's about this connection between the, the inner psyche of your DNA and the world at large. He says, photons, because photon is the highest kind of light that is known, okay? The highest kind of light in the universe is known as photonic light. It's, uh, photons are created from electrons, and it's the highest kind of physical light that anyone has ever seen or know about. Now, Deepak Chopra says, photons come out of nowhere. They cannot be stored, and they can barely be pinned down in time. And they have no home in space whatsoever. So he's talking about that they're transcendent. That is, light occupies no volume and has no mass. The similarity between a thought and a photon is very deep. Both are born in the region beyond space and time where nature controls all processes, in that void which is full of creative intelligence. So there is a man in one simple paragraph explaining the connection between the photon, which is an emitted from our, from our inner being, and the world, the, uh, what we consider to be matter. Now, Jeremy Narbury, in a book called The Cosmic Serpent, says something along the same lines. He says, in the 1980s, thanks to the development of a sophisticated measurement device, a team of scientists demonstrated that the cells of all living beings emit photons at a rate of up to 100 units per second and per square centimeter of surface area. They also showed that DNA was the source of this photon emission. So anyone who, in the sound of our voice who thinks we're just talking some new age claptrap, think again. The science is in for this. The DNA, the cellular structure of the being, the, the human being's light body, generates photons. These photonic action, this photonic action affects matter. We are, our DNA is connected to the Schumann resonance of the Earth. In my DVD on 2012, I go into this. So there's an intimate connection. Now the ancients specialized in this connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm. But just, it seems strange, doesn't it, that in 18 years of, of being under the fluorescent lights in a school, somehow they omit to tell us any of this. Yeah. <laughs> that we're taught for 18 years, but they just happen to forget to tell us that your mind and the, and the, and the matter, the world, it happens to be deeply and intimately connected. Right. Uh, they send us out into the world not knowing that. Fantastic. And then they wonder why the world is in the state that it's in. Yes. My God. They'll tell you that with the sweat of your brow, you learn a wage to be a slave. That they tell you. Right. right? They point that out in 3D. S sit here, move there, do right. this, jump through this hoop. All that's explained. But it's never explained that your mind and the, and the universe are connected physically, scientifically? No. My God. We'll never let you know that. Right. So now that we do know this, we understand that we need now to make a phase shift within the, within the community, within the world, into what I'm talking about, that we are now entering a deconstructive cycle. If you don't believe it now, just hang around and wait 12 months, yeah. and Pluto will be happy to uh, announce it for you, because it's going to come knocking on the door. Because whether you go to church or you're Christian or you're not, light is very important in all religion, light. Yes. But light has several types of properties. Light can be used against you. Why do you think the Illuminati are called the Illuminati? Right. If I'm shining a bright halogen light in your face, then two things happen. One is that you are blinded, and I am concealed from your sight. 
So light can have very, it can be used as a weapon, as it's being used by those who think of themselves as Luciferians, people of the light. That's one thing. The second thing is that light also shines up the dirt that we might happen to have on us. So be a little hesitant before you say, I want to walk into the light. Do you? Because that light's first thing it's going to do is shine up any kind of contortion or dirtiness or filth that you might have around you. And that is something you may not expect. Well, that's exactly what the property of light has. So when we move in front of galactic sun, and that spiritual energy starts permeating into our planet and into our psyche through the lens of Pluto, even if you don't understand what astrological jargon means, it's very, very simple. It means you're going to start seeing the dirt, just like when the light filters through your window and suddenly you see all the particles in the air and you start to see all the dust that you thought you'd cleaned. Yes. Well, this is what Pluto has a very brilliant uh, methodology of doing. That's so you don't need to be into tarot cards and astrology to grasp, grasp the meaning of this. You're going to start being, you're going to see the toxic, you're going to be forced to see the toxicity of the world and the toxicity within yourself because it's time to clean it. The right. brave, the courageous person who knows that, that that's healthy, yes, there's nothing wrong with that, is going to have no problem. No, not at all. Why should you have any problem? You see that the yard is dirty, you get a broom and you go and clean it. Right. Okay, you get the detergent and you go and you do the right job and everything. It's no more, it's no more difficult than cleaning your physical body and cleaning your teeth. It's just that it's more difficult a little bit because we've been neglecting it for hundreds and hundreds of years and we've just never bothered to empty the trash. So now the stench from the trash is ruining the world you know, in which we live. It's polluting the world in which we live. You walk down the street, it's oozing out of people. Don't you know that by now? Oh, yeah. And then we, we, are, we are overcome with it, you see? But we don't know how to clean and then we're so into this compassion bit, forgive the other person and see always see the good side, that we can be you know, uh, w walking around and, and uh, giving our light to people who are not deserving of it and very, very toxic. And so there's some individuals that even use us as their particular uh, personal shower. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. Think I'm joking? Oh, there's no. individuals who, who use us as their dumpster in the night when we're not looking. They'll come and dump all their trash uh, on our doorstep. Right. And we think it's mighty holy to then go and clean up after them. Well, I, I don't find, find where it says that. I don't remember anything like that saying that. No, I am very familiar with what the shamanistic tradition talks about. And the shamanistic tradition says if you're not clean, the world tree will throw you off the rotten fruit. Right. And that pruning is necessary. And that deconstruction is necessary. See, we've forgotten all these mystery school shamanistic teachings about how difficult it was to pass the grades. Because well, we've yeah. had plenty of pseudo-shamans tell us, hey, we'll give you it for, for pennies in the streets. Right. Or even just these... We've forgotten just what kind of, you know, uh, discipline we require. Yeah, these secret societies. And we've forgotten societies. how to set our boundaries. And now we have the most toxic people imaginable in the seats of power, in the seats of religion, sweet-talking us, handing us a little bit of, you know, sweetness on the surface, and we just bite down on it because we're so empty inside. Right. The man who's strong inside doesn't need any of that. He doesn't, he doesn't exchange salt and sugar and say, oh, well, they look the same, they must taste the same. Well, that's what we're doing now in the world. It's definitely backwards. There's, a, there's an incredible quote in the Bible, Jeremiah 5. If Christians are listening to this, Go to Jeremiah 5. It says, Among my people are wicked men who lie in wait, while men who snare birds, and like those who set traps to catch men. Like cages full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. They have become rich and powerful and have grown fat and sleek. Their evil deeds have no limit. They do not plead the case of the fatherless to win it, and they do not defend the rights of the poor. This is not just of our own time. New World Order is not something of 2000, you know, and, and the, the 21st millennium. New World Order has always existed. Right. New World Order is the, is the rule of the law that said that you, as a feudal villager, could not walk or, or stray 10 miles from your village. New World Order, in the, from the 13th to the 15th century, is the New World Order that said the, death, the life expectancy of these slaves will be no more than 25 years of age, and you'd be lucky to pass 21. Just a few generations ago, Freeman, our forefathers were married by the time they were nine, fought a couple of wars, you know, planted a few fields, and then died a rotten death at 21. And this was for the, all of the world. So you don't have to be uh, having a degree in psychology or anthropology to realize the consequences of this. That if age after age after age, people didn't even have life experience that moved past 21, then that's why you find so many gormless, idiotic people walking around in the world today. It's not their fault. It's purely, it's in our racial memory, it's genetic. Right. Human beings, just a few hundred years ago, didn't even have the life experience. They had barely got out of their adolescent thinking patterns. 
Imagine a world of teenagers running around. Right. With all of that, you know, incredible angst on one side, the emotional chaos, oh, yeah. the cocktail of emotions. You should go into history books and read about it, about the kind of mind that was still so undifferentiated from the unconscious that that's why they saw these devils and demons. That's why they were so into omens and superstitions. They believed that people were putting hexes on them, curses on them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is all coming out of that adolescent mind that is still not very differentiated yet. So if, the, if, if someone has prevented you from even having, my goodness, a life expectancy, longevity, then how can you grow to wisdom? How can you move towards any kind of real understanding of the world it is? That's why just a few hundred years later, the world is in this completely dumbed down state as then. It's easy to do once you have restricted the movements and even the physical longevity. You have that much control over human beings. All of this needs to come to light. People ask me when I do shows on the uh, Druidic tradition, the Celtic tradition, they, they can't believe, you see what I'm saying about a lot of the, the Druids being the, uh, or the Ireland being the origins of civilization, not, not the Judeo-Christianity. Judeo yeah. I say, well, don't you understand that Christians and, and, and Christianity and Romans, the Romans who slaughtered half the world in their day, they believed in writing. The Druids did not like writing. Their tradition was an oral tradition. So if you don't find any traces of it today, or very few traces, it, it was very, very easy to do by those who decided to write down history. Right. They could, they could say what they wanted to say. Don't you get it? Just because they t teach it to you in school doesn't mean it's true. We don't have, we don't have documentaries. We don't have, uh, you know, uh, Bill Curtis with his camera back in, you know, the pre-Diluvian days telling us what it was like. We, ha we are forced to believe what very evil people wrote down or the, the historians that they commissioned. And if it's written, we have also been mind-controlled to believe it's true. Right. So the, the Romans and the Christians were not just into writing things down because, because for no reason. That was a very significant shift, by the way, because all previous people did not bother writing down history. The, the history was in their mind. They lived it. They lived it in their traditions, in the very way they cooked their food, in the way they built their houses, in their language. So if you find no traces of, say, this great Celtic world universal study that Jordan Maxwell has studied all his life, that I've been studying, there's a good reason is because we have we have been we've had inserted a written form of history that we are compelled to believe and yet we should be very skeptical about that because the oral tradition was the one from the bards and the minstrels that has long you know been erased today right but the very fact that individuals did not even live past 25 years of age think about it it's extremely important that was we we are inheriting that lack of experience so when wise people come to us and try to inform us about how our habitat, how we're under kinds of control, we don't accept it. If somebody comes and points out that, do you see that the owner of this dog in, in, in teaching this dog is, is, is uh, changing its behavior, that we understand. If we're sitting in school and direct, there's a teacher physically in front of us, we understand that our behavior is being changed by a teacher because it's one-on-one. -on -one. That's the normal way of training. Right. But suddenly if somebody says, ah, but, you see, I can change the habitat of this anthill in the middle of the, you know, jungle or down in, in Africa. I can change the behavior of these gorillas or these uh, termites, not directly, but I am changing the habitat of these entities, these creatures, far outside their level of understanding, on the periphery of their vision. But I know that in a few years, because I'm making these changes, their actual behavior is also going to change. Right. Then you go with a microphone and you interview the termite and you say, excuse me, do you realize that you're being, you know, controlled? They go, what are you talking about? Everything's going on perfectly normal in the, in the, in the ant hill, in yeah. the termite hill. No changes. You're insane. Take yourself off. All right. So this is why there's so much of a knee-jerk reaction that you must be crazy if you're into these, these things. Because you're trying to explain that it's happening on the periphery. So if you try to take people up the slope so that they can have a, a bit of a peripheral vision, they can have a, a view of how the matrix is run. They don't want to climb. They get out of breath. They want to murder you because you're trying to give them more light. It's kind of like... Because you're trying, trying to say, look, if you just take a few steps up this mountain, I know it's hard, I know it's steep, I know you might skin your knees, but you see, you have to climb up a little bit because then you're going to see a greater panorama, the beautiful reciprocal action of this climb is that, yes, it might be arduous, but you're going to have a tremendous view of the world order. Yes. Well, people go, no, but I'm happy down here on the, on the vertical, I mean, on the horizontal. Why should I worry with all of that? You know, I know I can't see further than my own block, that I'm relatively blind, socially, spiritually, and all of it, 
But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm con it's convenient. It's too, it's too difficult. It's kind of like trying to explain to animals that they're in a zoo and that yeah. you, you've got this, this, you know, this thing inside of you that knows there's a, a, a world outside of that zoo, but you can't make anybody believe it and you yourself can't see it. And you get glimpses and you've got internal memory of it, genetic memory. Yes, you do. And we know. And, it, it, you know, that sparks the spirit of rebellion. Uh, and, and don't forget, it's not that we're saying that nobody doesn't ask these questions. Of course, a lot of people ask these questions and do want to climb and do want to say, you know, where does this elevator go? Yes. But then we've got the parents going, oh, but, 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 but don't touch that. <laughs> yeah. Or we've got the, the other side that comes and goes, oh, you don't want to leave. I know it's difficult, so guess what? We'll give you more gadgets to play with. Here's some new toys. Right. You don't need to go there. Uh, I know it's been a bit rough in the past, and that, you know, we slaughtered and murdered you and killed your forefathers. And all. But listen, I'll tell you what. Here's a computer. Here's some gadgets. Here's cell phones. Here's a skateboard. Here's virtual reality. Here's this. Here's that. Here's TV. Right? It's yeah. not that I'm saying any of these individual things are bad, but it's all how you use them and what they're used for. Absolutely. But the idea is that if these are just the chains of gold to replace chains of iron, well, then they're, no, they're not very good. But it's no good screaming at the TV or the cell phone. You just go, okay, I understand what's happening here. These are meant to be toys to pacify me. I'm going to use them for what I need to use them for, but they're certainly not going to pacify me. In fact, I'm going to use them to get online and find out who's teaching the truth. Right. I'm going to use radio because I'm going to listen to Freeman Fly Show, and, and I'm going to listen to Art Bell, and I'm going to listen to Jeff Rents, and I'm going to, hey, hey, I'm going to you know, listen to the, what's going on. So it's about how you use these tools. Yes. The tools themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. But if they're there to say, oh, good, they've sweetened us up now, they've dumbed us down, then, of course, you, you, you have a problem. And a lot of people are taking this uh, uh, sugar coating and then turning their minds off. Definitely. Conditioned and that to is bling. absolutely not, you know, not what we want to do. But the 2012 is, it's like a mountain. We're talking about a mountain. It is like a mountain. It's like a mountain with two slopes. And two types of people are climbing on either side. On one side, you have the toxic person who does not want to change, who wants to remain within their own, you know, bubble of illusion. Mm. And you, on the other side, you have the clean person who is self-actuated, and it's just to sort of find out who's going to reach the peak first. That's basically what we're looking at. Right. And, and massive, massive change. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, our very history is going to be wiped away as, as new understandings come forward, as we start to recognize our ancient past, and these are going to open up new ideas for the future, and even the connections with, uh, you know, extraterrestrials as much well, as... Well, you see, this is part of my work with the Atlantis, Atlantis concept that, as I've said, the Nephilim or the children of the Nephilim have been long designed to vacate this planet. Right. And a lot of what has been going on with the New World Order coming down again, and the draconian orders, and the, the, all this sort of toxicity that's leaking from the planet, has to do with the desire of the children of the Nephilim to vacate this planet, to build back the technology as they're doing, and then to try and get off of here. Right. And my book, of course, goes into that. I also believe that there's a possibility, I've been studying this very deeply, in the ancient mythologies, it actually talks about that some of these original Nephilim beings, I mean the original ones, are in a state of um, animated sleep and are still buried or interned here on the earth. Now, I've thought this often. Pardon? Yeah, I, I'm, I've been studying it, researching it. I've got a lot of information coming out on a new DVD. I'm still in the process of making up my own mind about it. Right. But again, I go by what the mythologies are saying. I at first thought that these individuals were you know, dead and gone, and of course it's only their bloodline exists. Right. But many of the mythologies are actually saying that, no, that's not the case, that some of them were put into a state of suspended animation uh, were interned in the earth and in certain locations of the earth and that now through satellite um, photography and through scans that they've done and even from old maps that they've all have been keeping for m millennia they now know where these underground mausoleums are and that they're getting ready one of the master plans is to get ready to disinter some of these beings and that this is what ties into the whole antichrist message of the of the christians and it's also mentioned in many, many other mythologies. I kept coming across this until I started to really wonder that why is Celtic mythology so full of this also? Could there be something physical in this about the beast being chained to the pit and then being released from their captivity? And that this could be something, I know it sounds pretty X-Files to a lot of people, but believe me, once you've studied these subjects long enough, nothing surprises you. Right. 
Um, you know, and we have a lot of interesting sci-fi channel shows and other shows sort of hinting at this. Uh, we're also being told from upstairs that this might in fact be happening if you're able to symbolically decode a lot of stuff that's coming over the television. There's something to this. And I've talked to Jordan Maxwell about it, and he completely agrees. And I even had a very interesting conversation with uh, Richard Hoagland about this in conjunction with these uh, Galactic Center conjunctions, and he is also uh, toying with this idea. Well, even just and I'm very much uh, convinced that the ancient British and uh, Celtic uh, mythology talks about it. And it's interesting that, uh, in light of current events, that they say that one of the places that one of these very powerful beings is interred in the earth happens to be Iraq. Right. Because it was in Iraq and Babylon that the, these Atlanteans first went after the great cataclysms that shook the earth. The only place that could sustain life or one of the only places that could sustain life, happened to be the place of the new equator, the Middle East, Mesopotamia, and that's where they set up their citadels, and that at least one of these individuals, uh, if you could call them that, is uh, vampiristic individuals, is uh -huh. interned there. Now, Richard Hoagland has done a lot of work on the Earth grid, and he's asked a lot of questions. I have an entire chapter on it at the back of my Atlantis book on how many banks, how many houses, uh, stately homes, how many uh, detonations of bombs, how many wars have gone on between the 30th and the 33rd meridian of the Earth? John F. Kennedy's assassination, uh, many Masonic lodges are between the 30th and 33rd meridian of the Earth. Many of the top churches, many of the top world events have happened uh, at this location. And we're wondering what, what this is all about. Is there something to this concept of the Earth grid? And could it be that some of these beings, that when they're interred, they're put at the junctions of some of these uh, etheric uh, cross points that are known as the dragon lines, the dragon paths? Um, is, it, is, it, is there something there that they can absorb the energy, the dark energy of the world, all the blood, all the mayhem, all the rapes and murders and, and serial killings and all the wars? Is there some way that this energy, well, if you go in and study the black arts, they're, they're happy to tell you that this is in fact the case, that the earth, like a sponge, there's a way to vampiristically siphon off this energy to feed something. Lots of science fiction and a lot of uh, occult history goes into this. And it starts to make sense when you start to realize what's going on here, that could there be some kind of a way that the traumatic energy of the world and of people's minds is being used and, and flowing into to sustain a certain kind of uh, off-world creatures who may be disinterred? Is there something to a lot of these uh, movies that are coming out? Yes. We, ha we have to look into all of this because there's something very interesting that's going to, going to be happening. And, and the Bible talks about it, and a lot of other of the ancient scriptures, like the Book of Enoch, are also talking about it. So, right. yes, the extraterrestrial thing is very much to be taken on into account because if there is an expediency to this, remember, if we're talking about photonic action coming down, if we're talking about the light from Pluto, or even if you want to buy into the photonic belt, mm -hmm. which I think is a very interesting concept, right. that the Earth and our solar system passes through a ionized field soon. At 2012, there's a field of ionized uh, photonic energy out there, a band that's been spotted by satellite and by uh, instruments. They know it's out there. What happens if our planet Earth and our sun and our solar system happens to pass through this every uh, 20, 000, uh, 10,000 years or so, just like the ancient people are telling us, like nature has a sort of spring clean, spin dry cycle? Well, don't you think then that the most toxic people on the planet, I'm not just talking about the kind of toxicity psychologically we were talking about earlier, but I'm talking about real incarnate evil, which I happen to believe exists. Oh, absolutely. Well, hell, they're, they're not going to like the fact that Roach Cleaner is uh, pulling his van around the corner and is heading down the block. Right. And it's a Roach Cleaner that you do not have to stop. This is Mother Nature coming with her broom. I mean, you can't fix it. Right. Do you you think can't that... buy her off. You can buy human beings off. You can dumb them down over several centuries. Sure, you can murder, slaughter, kill them. That's oh, the sport. That's easy. There's no opposition whatsoever. Hell, they're running around. They don't even know what day of the week it is. Right. But you can't fix Mother Nature. She's coming in with her broom, and you're, 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 you're finished. So is this what we're seeing? Is this why they're saber-rattling like crazy? Is this why they're climbing over the bodies of the dead and don't even mind how blatant it is? Right. Now even on television with George, they're not even really trying to hide the fact that there's a draconian new world system that's taking away your rights, that they can have status like Gonzalez and these other creatures running for, and they're not even really hiding it. I have many people telling me they're not even hiding. Of course they're not. Yeah. But could that be because they know they're in not such little time left that they don't have time for the spin doctors to keep on hiding the, the machinations? That, Like in my book, it says they may be coming more out into the open now because they just don't have any time. 
Seems that, that way. they've got to vacate this entire wing of the of the solar system, otherwise they're going to be eradicated. Right. I mean, Lord of the Rings, Professor Tolkien, who knew everything what I'm talking about, one of my biggest mentors. Is it is it an accident that his three movies should come out at the equinoxes and the solstices of the world, telling us in metaphor what is happening? There's tremendous metaphors in those books and in those movies that we need to understand. Yes. And they're not the only movies that are telling us about it. No, Something archetypal forces And abound. could it be that they know, these arc, higher arcs, know what we don't know, and that they can already feel the rise of the light? And if they feel the rise of the light, they're going to want to compensate, because just as like we, f we like oxygen, what happens if this uh, incoming light makes them feel extremely irritated? Then won't they want to pollute the earth more? Won't they want to cut down more of the Amazon? Won't they want to pollute more, because that then helps to create the environment that they are used to? Won't they want more war? Yes. Won't they want more blood? Well, isn't that happening? Yes. 30 years we've been talking about global peace and brotherhood of man and, and globalism this and globalism that, and now we're back in another war. Okay, right. so what, what was all that claptrap from the 1970s about diversity and blah, 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 and the peace in the north and, uh, you know, uh, uh, United Nations is going to fix it, and it's just the greatest times in the world, and here we are back in wars again. Is anybody awake to realize what on earth is going on? That these individuals have no intention of bringing peace or harmony to the earth because that makes them feel horrible? In the Origins of Evil talk that I do, that's free web stream, I talk about the fact that vultures and carrion crows, you don't normally find them sitting dining in a Japanese tea garden. Right. Right? No. no. They, they, you find them on the, on the rotting corpses. Well, the same creatures who are ruling our world, and it's not just George Bush, it's, it's, it's every right. one of them, every single one of them, all over the world, wherever they are. Because just like cream floats to the surface, so does filth. Right? right? In politics, you'll always find the degenerates. At the top. At the top, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, just, it's just the reverse. So these individuals want carnage. They want fear leaking from every mind. Yes. They want paranoia. They want craziness. They want fear. They want you know, all sorts of neurosis because they feel ah, wonderful. This is Bahamas for them. They love it. This is incredible. <laughs> Haven't you seen Lord of the Rings? I mean, I mean, it's there. We've been teaching it for years. They don't want a peaceful, har you want a peaceful, harmonious world. Right. But they don't. No. So they're going to mess you up racially, they're going to mess you up ethnically, they're going to open the borders, mm -hmm. they're going to do everything against the sovereignty of the world, or sovereignty of, of the Western man. They're going to completely put you into a situation that is completely dysfunctional, in every which way. Right. So that you're biologically, physically, mentally, spiritually, and, and, and economically are in complete chaos. Beautiful. Love it. <laughs> then they put a TV in your home, a news on every night, so that north, east, south, and west, the news... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you can see all the horrors that are happening to your other brothers and sisters. Right. That fear reaction has two, two reactions. One, it creates more fear from you, which is then picked up in the electromagnetism of your very own room, by the way, and then fed into the earth grid. And the second thing is, is it's good for them to see, see how much horror we're perpetrating on you guys. We'll even give you a news program that will show you it. Oh, yeah. We love this. Yeah, we'll make movies and TV right. shows out of it. We'll show you <laughs> Because we love this, and we want you to know about it. Can you please observe? We're turning on the screen now, and we're going to show you the chaos that we have created in your own world. So yeah. sort of, turn on the TV at 6 o'clock and watch it. And we do watch it, but we're thinking this just happens automatically. Right. We just think this, this, is, this is just built into the, to the walls of the system, of the world. Exactly. Left to, to itself, this is what man does. No, left to himself, man does not in fact do any of this stuff. Right. A sick man might do those things. A person who's screaming to find the one tiny corner where he can crouch in his own palace because the toxicity has been building up and building up and building up and he has no tools to clean it. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's the way a sick, infirm person might act, but that is not how the unmolested human being would act. No, 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 no. Evidence has proven that that is not the case. Right. I have a DVD coming out called uh, Divination and the Goddess Tradition. Uh -huh. which will tell people about what man was really like previous to 30,000, 40,000 years ago before we were infected by this extraterrestrial virus. Right. And that but really is the biggest or difference. Bloodline is wanting to get off this planet because they've understood something about planets. They've understood something about the natural cycle. And the Maya understood it many thousands of years ago. So what you're hearing when they say it's a Mayan prophecy, well, it's no more prophecy than if you wrote a cookbook saying, if you cook the potatoes and the carrots this way, this will be the ultimate goal. Right. It's not really a prophecy. It's you're an expert cook, and you know that if you follow these instructions, the dinner will be called, you know, this. 
you will have a lasagna if you prepare it in exactly this way. It's not really a prophecy. So all of these guys are going, it's Maya prophecy. No, no, no. The Maya were just the, the same coterie of Atlanteans and Lemurians who understood the cycles of the planet Earth that in uh, 2012 is a physical scientific fact that this alignment will bring us more photonic light or that the planet Pluto might be, might be doing X, Y, Z, you see? Uh-huh. Then they said, this is the dish that history is going to prepare. And in our manual, we're going to say, we have all this time to do what we need to do. And then come 2012, it's the end date. Right. So Pull it's, it out it's of the not oven. a prophecy, it's an outcome. It's, it's nothing about seers, some mystic sitting under a mushroom in the Mexican desert going, I see you into the future. No, no, no. Right. It's perfectly understandable to anyone who knows cosmic cycles that this is how much time you guys have got. And then here's where the phase shift comes in. And we're just going to write it down or tell you about it. Right. We happen to be the generation that is living in that 13th age of the Maya, ready to move into what they call the sixth world. So as, uh, as it says on the article on the website, if your own house is in order, then you have nothing to worry about because that is the seminal law of the universe, that the guardian and the Holy Spirit is with you if right. your own house is in order. But if your own house is not in order and you are running around in the streets waving placards, firing, firing bows and arrows at the, at the corporations and trying every other stratagem to bring down evil, all that constitutes is that you are not party to the crime of evil. Right. Your actions are actually feeding those people because you're not psychically in your center. That is the mystery of the Lord of the Rings movie as well. If you're not in your center, then you are doing more harm than good. Don't they show you that the leader that the, uh, the head wizard has gone over to the dark side in that film? Mm -hmm. Right. So our problem, you see, is not the adversary. It's the tyrants. It's these corrupt souls within our own, the corrupt souls within our own um, field, our own. It's like this. When warriors used to go to battle on the field of battle, the warrior knows he has the enemy to worry about. But much more than that, he has a fear in his comrade's eyes to worry about. If he is not sure of his companions, he's already lost. Right. Doesn't matter what kind of enemy, or how strong the enemy is. In our own side are people who are not clean, who are claiming they're of the good, but they are not armed up properly. These are our liabilities. So I don't give a damn how powerful, you know, what's happening in the corridors of power and how we're, what we're going to do, you know, with the Illuminati and all of this stuff. That's uh -huh. very interesting. It's an interesting study. Right. Please continue studying that. Uh -huh. But there is a whole other world right. of interest and that we need to focus on. And that is, are we ready? Why are we seeing fear, paranoia, and psychosis in the, in the eyes of people who are claiming to be of the light? <laughs> we better worry about that. Right. Because I ain't riding out to battle, you know, with these characters. Not at all. Well, hell, I'm, personally, I'm riding out to battle whether they come or not. That's what I've been doing in my life, but that's just me. Right. But the rest of the human race better wonder, what is this? Why, we don't look ready. Yeah. Well, I think so, that yeah. this is this a This is great... very important to take on board. So the strengthening process of the individuals who claim to be of the light, which is an educational process. Jordan Maxwell has always said this. It's an educational process. No need for fear, there's no need for worry, no need for panic. Right? Uh -huh. It's just a virus has infected us, and we're, home up, we're, we're, we're tuned in to the fact that we don't cut it, slash it, burn it. We find a homeopathic remedy so that we become the stronger for it. Right. Now we educate ourselves then in our own time to find out what is the remedy for this. It's a very wonderful process. It's a highly educational process. It may involve you stepping into areas that your fellows don't step into, like David Icke has warned. Uh -huh. that you may have to step outside, you see, the norm, the comfort zone. Absolutely. But that's all right. You might have to do that anyway when the celestial uh, change is taking place. So why not do it on your own steam now? Hey, it may not be I comfortable agree. to you, but I'll tell you one thing. Living as a prisoner in your own uh, mansion, that can't be very comfortable. No, it's not. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's not. So then get with it. 200 years ago, this country was able to take these tyrants by the scruff of the neck and throw them back in the Atlantic Ocean and go, get away. We don't want to know you. Keep out. And it was only three that, between 3 and 6% of this country that did that. The rest of them were shivering under the bed in fear like they always are. So how, how come they could do it then, but we can't do it now? But you know why? Because of what I'm talking about. We're already fighting ourselves. 
there's too many people claiming to be within the um, sphere of light who are actually either misinformationalists, disinformationalists, or just so confused and chaotic that they're infecting the rest of us. All right. We need to deal with them. We need to put them in their place first before we deal with an enemy. Know thine enemy, it says in the Bible. And know thyself. And know thyself. Absolutely. Well, know Michael, we need to wrap this up. Aspect. We need to wrap this up now. Uh, I, I so appreciate you coming by or coming, phoning in. Listen, I tell you, like I said last time, if the airways are dead, then we have really something to worry about. So, you know, I, people like me can be doing my work, but being provided the platform to reach people, that is absolutely essential because that is the great work that needs to be done. And, and people are out there. They are listening. We have a very positive response the last time. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, this information is old information, but it's, it needs to come around again. Again. In order to understand where we're going, we have to understand our past and the place from which we come. Uh, there is a free web stream on my website, taroscopes.com. Uh, people can contact me uh, about that, and we have a lot of free information for people to you know, continue connecting the dots. Absolutely. It's all out there. You know, We just need to wrap our brains around it. Yeah. Well, it's thank all you again, knowledge. You know, We're just stepping back and realizing that we are our own priests and priestess, and we're using the tools at hand to empower ourselves. That's the key thing, because it's a homeopathic f fact that once your own immune system, and I mean that spiritually, psychologically, is so strong that nothing can affect you, then you've won. It's the old Bruce Lee principle. When you're so strong that your enemy cannot destroy you, then you've won. Right. Then you have defeated them. This is the kind of law that we need to understand. Throwing spears while you yourself are naked, that's absolutely the way we've been doing it, and that's not going to work. It's grassroots, total grassroots uh, solutions and simple premises that we need to get back to in order to sustain ourselves. And once that is done, then the enemy is already going to be defeated. And we have, with the cosmic clock is actually with us. We have had fantastic mentors of the past with us, teaching us this, and we will continue to have them. We just now have to have the manual put in front of us. We've been running around like headless chickens because, you see, we haven't been, the manual of what to do has not been placed on our hands. Once we're able to say, ah, oh, now I see the manual. Sure, I can handle that. Right. So this is what my work is very much to do, is to try and, I am not a prophet or anything. I'm just coming along to say to people, hey, this is one of the ways in which you can, you know, bring healing to yourself and to the world in which you live. Because the earth has sustained us, and we need to make sure that we take care of it. Well, thank you very much. Okay, it's, Freeman, it's, take it's, care, it's my a, friend. Uh, we'll I will. Do it again. I will definitely be in touch, uh, and hopefully we can do this again. I'll be off for a month now, so uh, then we'll we'll get back to it. Great, because there's a lot more to share, so I appreciate that. Yeah, an hour is just not enough to cover anything. Not really, but you know we do our best, and thank you again. Yes, thank you, Michael. Right, I will. Uh, I'll talk to you soon.